All right, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome the fabulous Patty to the Sasaga podcast. So Patty, please tell us who you are and what you do. Well, Helen, thank you so much. I'm the fabulous Patty Dominguez. I'm going to own that for this podcast and maybe even beyond that. Um, so I'm the founder of Positioning to Profit. And once upon a time, I left my cushy corporate job back in January of 2013. Mm-hmm. And in, the, in that moment, a lot of people thought I was absolutely crazy to turn down a promotion, to give back my stock options, to leave a career that I had uh, worked so very diligently to re- to just kind of go up the ranks in the corporate or in the corporate ladder. And I just left because I really wanted to venture into entrepreneurship. So I've been doing that since January of 2013. And I was just telling you when we were offline that it's been almost nine years and I'm really, I'm really proud of that. You know, it takes a lot of tenacity to build a business and to really understand the unwritten rules. And so I learned this concept of unwritten rules when I was in corporate, because that's another environment that doesn't teach you the unwritten rules. You have to navigate ambiguity in corporate and you have to navigate ambiguity in the, in the entrepreneur world as well. So I really think that that's something that I just have this innate ability to jump into a situation and figure things out. And I'm on, and I have the attitude of like, okay, I'm not going to be denied, right. I'm going to keep going until. So the thing that I recognize in that journey is that there was a whole lot of ups and downs and you have to take the ups and the downs together, because when you look at the aggregate of that, it really is something really rewarding. If you really understand how the equation to success works. Mm -hmm. So I do that in my own business. And now I help uh, women in entrepreneurship do the same. Right. So when you have those downs, they actually lead to even more ups, right? Absolutely. And I think as a matter of fact, um, I was just, uh, I think it was last week, I did a video that I posted in in the group that we have in the community around this concept. It is not my concept, it came from Seth Godin, but I kind of grabbed the overall general concept around the dip, you know, just really understand, if you understand this, this is one of the best secrets to success, whether you are in a corporate job or in your own entrepreneur venture or thinking about it, okay? So this applies universally, which is magical. Mm -hmm. And that really is, if you stop and think about a moment where you decide to venture into something new. It could be a new job, a new company that you're working for, stepping out into your own business, et cetera. At the beginning, there is so much inspiration that you feel just fueled up, amped up, like you're going to conquer the world, right? You Mm -hmm. feel like the world is your oyster and you're so excited to hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. Well, inevitably what happens, you start to either do your marketing, because that's really where I live, you know, on the marketing side, um, you should you put yourself out there and you're very excited. And what happens when you launch something or you get into your career and you work on something and it didn't really work well, mm-hmm. you have the, that moment where that Seth Godin talks about as the dip. And the dip is that like that lowest level, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And in that dip, is where you have those wall kicking moments, Mm -hmm. the moments of despair, the moments where you're like, this is unfair. Why did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. This really stinks. Uh, I am really struggling here and we get caught up in our stories, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in that dip, most people will either retract into their safety zone Mm -hmm. and, or they'll give up. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in the dip and you give up and you're in that space of like, oh, this is just too hard, you know, I'm going to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. When people are in that dip, the people that have success are the ones that push through the dip. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of working through those situations, going on the other side and saying, okay, well, what can I fix? That didn't work. What would work? What else can I try out? Mm -hmm. And That was a significant book for me. It's a quick read. It's really simple, but it was significant for me because I had the attitude of like, I'm going to do this until. So Mm -hmm. you can apply that to your listeners, to your millions of listeners, Helen, (laughs) they can apply the same concept is like, just have the until approach. 
Mm. Like I'm going to work in this until I get there. And where's the there? The there is wherever you want it to be, whether it's making a million dollars or launching a business successfully, replacing your income, climbing the ladder up into right executive vice president, whatever that until is Mm. just have your eyes on the prize and recognize that U shape of starting out, Mm -hmm. trying something, going through the dip, pushing through, fixing, correcting, course correcting, whatever you want to call it and staying there until, and that's what you get is going to get you success that you're looking for. I love this so, so much. And one of the, um, kind of questions or topics that comes up a lot in my community is about negative thinking. So when women have, especially women um, who I am, you know, I'm working primarily with women now, um, when something has not gone to plan, um, they can very easily get into negative thinking. You talked about wall kicking moments, the the negative Mm -hmm. thinking that then keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And I I talk about my approach to how to deal with that. I would love to know um, from your experience, or maybe if if you've got even a story that you can share of when something went really did not go well and how you managed to get out of that negative thinking of like, ah, (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh, I could tell you so many times. I mean, I think that for me, one of the most significant times was when I first quit my job and I was in entrepreneurship and I had invested a lot of money in a mastermind of a popular guru that you see it on the internet. And then I put together a webinar and I, you know, practice a webinar. I wanted to make it perfect. And in that perfectionism, I was overthinking. Okay, so those are some markers of complete disaster because I got in my head. And when you get in your head, you're in your left brain and you're overanalyzing and you're just getting ready to get ready is what I call it. Mm -hmm. And that moment of getting ready to get ready is going to literally keep you in procrastination. Anyway, I finally got beyond my procrastination. I launched or I, I launched some Facebook ads. I spent I think about $1,800 in Facebook ads, I did, or I was able to generate a lot of leads or a lot of people that were interested in seeing the webinar. And I was planning on selling my program at the end of it. And I had a whole bunch of people on the line and I didn't realize that the software that I was using to pitch the webinar went black. Like there was no slide showing. I couldn't see the audience, but I kept talking, thinking, that they were seeing everything that I was seeing. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is I, I got through the entire presentation and I didn't even see the chat. And I just came to find out that everyone had dropped off. So I didn't sell anything. It was something that I had prepared for. And I sent a Voxer uh, to the guy who was in charge of the mastermind. And I literally started crying <laughs> in my in my self-pity and saying, I can't believe I spent all this money, this and that, this and that. And he's like, you're good you cycled. I'm like, what do you mean? I cycled. I'm thinking some other kind of cycle, like in the women way. And it's not that (laughs) kind of cycle he was talking about. He was talking about, he's like, you have to fail at something. So now that you got that out of the way, when are you going to do the next one? And I snapped out of my self pity and I just like, oh, wow, he made it sound so simple. And we live in our self pity and we live in regret because we choose to, Mm -hmm. instead of recognizing that, what if we could reframe it and just say, you know what? I'm not going to give that any meaning. I'm going to recognize, well, that didn't work. And -hmm. then just go back to the drawing board. Right. Mm -hmm. And then that was really a pivotal moment for me because the lesson there was he wasn't going to give in to my self pity. And he's like, great, you failed now. So the next time, now that that's out of the way. Mm -hmm. And so I always look at it that way. Now that that's out of the way, let's just keep going. And that's how you have to approach it. Because yeah. as you and I both know, nothing has any meaning, but the meaning we give it truly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love that. Okay. So I am hoping listeners, Sasuga podcast listeners and viewers on the uh, video version, keep that in mind. It's so important to move on. Just keep moving on. And even when mm-hmm. those thoughts come back up again, it's like, okay, we're, we're done with that. Let's move on. <laughs> yes. And I'll tell you if I, if I may, I think the thing that's really important, I do this with a friend of mine too, that we keep in touch is like, 
about that. She's an entrepreneur as well. And this applies to anybody. If you're in that space, literally put the timer on for 10 minutes and then have your pity party. Yeah. And then after the timer's gone, they're like, okay, you know, brush it off. Yeah. That's it. You only get the 10 or 15 minutes max. Yeah. And then that's it. And then you move on. You can't yeah. give it any more fuel yeah. because it's just going to take over your, your energy and it's just not worth it. But yeah. you put the timer on, let it rip for 10, 10 <laughs> minutes and then just move on. I think that's a really powerful practice, actually. I, I love that. Yeah. Timer, like, let's just be as upset as possible in these 10 minutes and then we can move on, you know, feel all yeah. the emotion and then move on from it. Mm -hmm. so on the topic of moving on let's get to the word of the year what's been the word of the year for you patty mine is ease and the irony behind that is i've been chronically a hardaholic in my former identity is i always made everything so hard and this year i really focus on making it easy so my the mantra was how can i work less and make more money and so really the the common denominator is is this easy like, is this light? Because if something is heavy, I don't do it. And I encourage my clients to do the same. Mm -hmm. Like, how does it feel, right? Mm -hmm. Because ease is a choice and you can absolutely make things easy. So why not? So ease. Mm, I love that. Okay, the question that comes to mind here though is what about our corporate listeners? And they may be thinking, well, I don't have a choice in this project. So what... What advice do you have there? I feel like having been in corporate for 18 years, I mean, I worked in Fortune 50 and, um, and consulting as well. So I have a pretty good, I, I feel very comfortable speaking in this sense is like, I remember for a long time, I felt like I was the only one, the only one who could do things. So I was, I had to, ha I had to be in control. Mm -hmm. And so how much of that is happening in your work where you can easily reach out for help? Mm -hmm. So somehow asking for help may seem like, oh, they're going to think I'm lazy or, oh, they're going to think I'm, I'm taking advantage. Oh, they're going to think that I'm not doing my hardest work and this and that. That's simply not true. Mm -hmm. And so in my haste to want to be in control, mm -hmm. I personally was so in control of control that I was out of control. <laughs> so I was making it very hard. And I recognize when I was leaving corporate, I gave myself about a year and a half where I was so easy about my path out of corporate that I would say no more. Mm -hmm. I, I would literally, if somebody asked me for something, I say, no, I'm not available for that. And mm -hmm. it's a little shocking because I feel like in corporate people are like, oh yes, yes, of course I'll do that. You know? Mm -hmm. as opposed to standing up for yourself and saying no. Mm -hmm. And I also asked for help more. And yeah. I was like, Hey, can we do this? Or what ideas? And just, I was so open and vulnerable because I didn't give it so much meaning. Cause in the back of my head, I'm like, well, I'm leaving anyway. But I thought it was really interesting when I started doing that, what happened was in my division of 420 people, there was a rating system and they have a superior achieve, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, they give awards to the, the, to the, to the employees that were superior in their achievements. Mm -hmm. There were only two people who got the superior achievement awards. I was one of them. That's when I left. And what's so interesting is the more I started stepping into my own and just being really honest mm -hmm. and reaching out for help and letting go of control, not only was the process easier, but I actually became more of an exemplary employee. Yeah. Isn't that it, ironic? It is amazing. And, you know, if I think back to my corporate career as well, if I was doing things differently, I would have been saying no more often and I would have been asking for help more often. Exactly. And the, 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 um, you you may have read the book Essentialism by uh, Greg. Is yeah, and I really think that's a book I want to revisit because I I read it a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's a great book. It's one that I, I I wrote a blog post about it years and years and years ago. We'll probably link to that in the show notes. Um, but it's it he talks about specific examples uh, because it's all about essentialism. It's all about doing less and and doing better. Mm -hmm. Um. And he gives these specific examples of people who did exactly what you just said of saying no and just like setting the boundaries. And then they they ended up being, you know, more highly evaluated the more they said no. 
So this is another message that I'm often sharing <laughs> with yeah, the community. Yeah, I, I also think that's such a beautiful example because what it also shows is that you have courage. Yes, yeah. And when you have courage, that, that stands out. You know what I mean? Because most people in my, my experience also, I mean, I, I, um, again, I was in corporate 18 years. I had a department, this whole thing. And the thing that I noticed was the people that were courageous are the ones that stand, that would stand out because everybody's MO that their modus operandi is self-preservation mm-hmm. and self-preservation doesn't stand out. Mm Self-preservation is not Mm high-performing. Self-preservation is just, yeah, I'm doing enough to skate by and yeah, you're doing a good job. Tap, tap, tap. That's average. But if you're stepping into into a courageous statement or you're doing something that stands out Mm -hmm. and it doesn't even have to do with the work per se, but it's an attitude Mm -hmm. that's going to stand out more in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I I love this so much. So let's go to the Sasaka success cycle and talking about the four phases. So phase one around self-care, phase two around planning, phase three around communication and four productivity, which phase would you like to focus on today where you can share what struggles you've had and what successes you've had? Well, I want to say I've had struggles and uh, in all of them. So I think all four of your pillars are absolutely essential. They all are, I can't imagine not having any, I'm looking at my paper here as I wrote down. And I really think that for me, productivity, um, again, once I started focusing on productivity and really bringing on a team and creating, I know this is immensely boring, but standard operating procedures, <laughs> that was a game changer for my business, a game changer. Mm-hmm. And it was like letting go of control, not thinking that I was the only one who could do it the right way. This Mm -hmm. absolutely applies if you're in corporate or in entrepreneurship, like really understand, am I in my zone of genius? We all have a zone of genius. What is that thing that you do better than anybody else can do? That is where you should live because that's going to give you the most joy and everything on the periphery that is in kind of in the realm that you've been working on give it to someone else, right? So for example, for me, doing social media is not in my zone of genius. Could I do it? Yes. Is it productive for me to do it? No. So Mm -hmm. I hired someone someone on my team who could do it. Same thing, if you're in your job, don't feel like you have to do everything. What Mm -hmm. could you like, is this in my zone of genius? Is this going to really uh, contribute to me standing out as a team member. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I had no issues when people would try to bring me on on projects. I would say, no, that's not, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to participate in that because I'm not going to add value. Mm -hmm. I need to focus on my goals for the year. And that may not be very popular, but I can tell you that my boss at the time thought he's like, wow, that's really bold of you to do that. Good for you. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, because I want to bring my highest and best use to this role and I want to stay in my zone of genius. How can you, how can anybody dispute that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a common theme when I'm coaching women who have gone into more senior positions, into manager, into director positions. And very often they're still attempting to do all of the things that they were doing previously. And it's very, very hard for them to to kind of let go and hand things over. But as you said, standard operating procedures is in, and that's something, you know, with my experience in um, in the Japanese corporate world is very often there'll be one person who they, they know how to do everything in their mind and it's not shared with people. And that's actually a really dangerous place to be for the organization. It is. It is because you're plate spinning, right? You got yeah. one plate spinning over here and then over here. And at a certain part, you you can only do that for so long. Mm-hmm. And again, that's a hundred percent control of control and you're out of control when you're doing that. Yeah. So really look at yourself and say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired and I have to do this and I have to do that. Come on, really? Do you have to really do everything or yeah. can you ask for help? 
And mm-hmm. that's a more productive way to, to look at things and say, am I being productive? Am I in my zone of genius? Because for me personally, when I'm in my zone of genius, and I say this to my own clients, stay in your zone of genius, you're going to be happier, you're going to be making more money, your your job or your career or whatever you're doing is going to be more fulfilling. So mm-hmm. really stop and take inventory of that, because I would challenge you, if you feel like you're spread thin, thin excuse me, you're doing too much. And guess what? You don't have to do it all. That's a fallacy. And it's a, it's a strategy that is broken and it's just going to lead to burnout. So yeah. stop doing that. It's not, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. work. And I can I, just uh, briefly to share, I, uh, many of my listeners have probably heard this before. I just really want to enforce it though. In my corporate days, I got to the stage where I was saying yes to so many things. I was taken to hospital in an ambulance from work. And oh my at God, that Helen. point- at that point, my company then hired someone else. And I'm not blaming the company by any means because it was me. Right. I yes. was the one who is saying yes to everything. And I was, you know, making it look like I can handle everything. And it was not the case. And the company very quickly, um, you know, dealt with it to bring more people in. So, you know, mm. very often people say, no, I can't possibly ask for more headcount or whatever. Well, if it means that, you may end up in hospital <laughs> it's worth asking. right yeah right yeah okay Whew. <laughs> big big topic so let's go into the uh, spontaneous questions um we talked about we just mentioned one book just now but what's your favorite book of the moment Oh my gosh, Helen, that's a, that's a hard one for me because I am notorious for having a pile of books that I read at any given time. Like right now I'm rereading The Alchemist, right? Because I read that a while ago. Um, So I'm rereading that one. We have a fellow friend of ours, Style Power, (laughs) that I'm reading. And then uh, on the more spiritual side, I'm reading um, like a chakra healing book. So Every morning I have my high leverage time. It's just my little time in the day or my prolific time as you coined it. Thank you, Helen. (laughs) And I go in here and I read 10 pages of a book. Now you're probably thinking 10 pages. Mm -hmm. Well, the important thing is to set a habit. And so 10 pages a day is 3,650 pages a year, which is the equivalent of 10 to 12 books. Mm -hmm. Most of the human population never reads one book in a year. So mm-hmm. you can read 10 to 12 books by just reading 10 pages a day. That's it. I love that so much. Okay. Let's keeping on the theme of habits then apart from your, um, reading, what's another habit that you have developed that you have found has been tremendously helpful for you? Well, for me, my high lever or my prolific time, I have to get used to saying, uh, cause I always say high leverage time. So my high leverage time or my prolific time is I basically work. I've been working out. So I work out four to five times a week. So I do it during the week and then, um, I come back and then I sit in my chair and I have my self hypnosis or you could call it your, your, your meditation, whatever it is. And that typically lasts up to 15 minutes. It's not long at all. And then I do my reading and then I just kind of go through, I learned this little thing from Jim Rohn. I set my day the night before. Mm -hmm. So the night before I I think about, okay, what am I going to do for the day? And so that leverage time is really important. And then I, uh, after I do that down here, I go and I talk to my husband, we have coffee, we chit chat about the day. And so that's an example of high leverage time, because even that 30 minutes to 45 that I'm just hanging out with him is our time, you know, it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. Um, And so really, it's just a matter of what's important to you. Take a look at what you want to, I'm telling you that two hours is so beneficial that it just helps me set the day in the right tone. And it's extremely productive when I do it. I love that. What is something, if we may ask this, what Mm -hmm. is something that you are working on right now to improve in yourself or in your business? Oh, what am I working on? Well, I have a new product that I'm putting together and it really is um, a compilation of all these beautiful things that I've learned. Um, When it comes to personal development, I think that it's been the greatest reward for me 
um, to just be a student since 2003 actually is when I started. So I'm putting together these little snippets of books that I've read and I'm looking here because I have my stack of books. So I'm putting that together in a bit of a course that I'm going to run for 21 days. And I'm really excited about it because I really feel like everybody has to work on themselves first Mm. before they become a successful fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. You want to be a successful executive, entrepreneur, business owner, whatever it is, you have to work on yourself first. Mm -hmm. And so this to me is like this compendium of, you know, awesome lessons and things that I've learned that have helped me personally. And so I'm putting it together. So I'm really excited about it actually. And what are, what are you personally working on for your, all right, are, for are me, you, it's all done. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, so, so this is something I'm putting the together. And then mm-hmm. for me personally, I'm going through, um, through Jim's for Jim Fortin's program again mm-hmm. from, uh, I'm not coaching in the group this time around. So I'm participating and I'm going through each one of the weeks and the modules, Mm. Um, at, coming in from like a student lens, you know, mm. and so I'm actually really enjoying that um, because I'm like, oh, this is really fun. You know, I'm doing everything as if I'm new to this because the first time I took the course was in 2018 and I think I'm way different. Mm-hmm. So it's really good to go back to the drawing board. I know some people have gone through it over and over and over again. Mm. I had been coaching in the group, so I don't necessarily go through the exercises and now I'm going through it, which I'm really, really enjoying. And what have you noticed is the biggest difference between the first time you took the program and now? Oh my God. (laughs) How long do we have? I mean, (laughs) I was so messed up. Like, and I mean by, and here's what I mean by that is that I had, when I joined in February of 2018, I had just come out of a business partnership that failed. It was a huge, ginormous failure Mm -hmm. and we, and I lost a lot of money and I was in a very bad place Mm -hmm. financially, personally, how I felt about myself, my confidence, everything, right. It was just not a good situation. And so I went into Jim's program the first time really like, okay, I'm just going to do this and see like, what's going on. Like why? And I had even told my husband, I had had said to himself, to him very vulnerable. I said, if you want to divorce me, I get it cause I'm a hot mess right now. Like I, we've put a lot on the line here and I've been a failure at this. And I was just in a low point. He's like, what are you talking about? No. Right. He's like, no, I wouldn't. Why would you say that? I'm like, because I feel like a failure. Mm-hmm. So I had to work on myself. And even though I had been reading books and doing things since 2003, it wasn't until the way that he teaches it in such a, a, a systematic way that was really helpful. And so it's just a matter of like the self-love is where it first starts. Mm-hmm. And really like self-love, self-worth. And again, my big thing was just being so, such a control freak. Mm -hmm. That was such a big one for me and procrastination. Mm -hmm. And now I'm looking at it from a different space of like, it's always at the root self-worth, but I think it's very different because I feel like now it's my next chapter in, in, in my career. Like, how do I even expand even more? Mm -hmm. because for me, I've been, I have, I've had success to the extent that I've more than replaced my corporate income and I've gotten kind of comfortable. And now I'm like, no, I got to put the foot on the gas and really just escalate, like really elevate. And I'm really excited about it. And at the same time, I'm like, Oh my God, it's kind of nerve wracking, but I have to do it (laughs) because it's time. Do you know what I mean? Uh So that's what I'm working on. And what is, if you look to the, the, uh, Patty of the future, 10, 20 years from now, how do you see her? Honestly, I really want to write this kind of like a seminal work of what I've learned through everything. Um, So I definitely want to write a book. And then I really want to just impact as many female, as many women in business as possible. I really get immense joy out of helping women to elevate their themselves, their brand, their business. And that's like the most rewarding thing. It's extremely addictive. So (laughs) I seriously could work all the time. And that's where I'm like, no, let me, (laughs) let me take a break here because it's, I love what I do. So I'm very fortunate that way. So to be honest with you, the more people I can help, the more rewarding it would be. I can't even imagine. So really focusing on scaling the business side of things so that I can impact more. And I know the money and all that other stuff is going to come as a byproduct of how many people I'm helping. Mm-hmm. 
So with that in mind, um, how can, what, what else would you like to share with our listeners today? We have the listeners and, and viewers in the corporate world, in the, those who are maybe thinking about their own business, those who are already starting their own business. What would you like to share with them today? Probably I would say um, the specialty of what are, where I really focus in, in on, let me, let me articulate that better. Where I really focus is on positioning to profit. And so that's my brand. It's positioning to profit.com. And if you go there, you can kind of, it's a little smorgasbord of everything that I have. So whether it's a positioning to profit book, you can find it there. It's just like a little guide, electronic guide. I have some things where I talk about the pillars of having a healthy business. <laughs> As Helen knows, I'm like really kind of particular about things that I talk about because I believe in the long game um, in building a business. I don't believe in flashy tactics. I think there's too much of that noise in the marketplace. And so I'm really in it about creating a sustainable long, uh, business for the long term. So you can find that information at positioningtoprofit.com. And also the Positioning to Profit podcast, which will definitely be. Yes, thank you. Well, because that's definitely that's on my podcast listening list. Love it so much. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I love doing the podcast and I love what you're doing, too. And I have no doubt that the ripple effect of everything that you're doing is going to create so much positive change and evolution for women in business in Japan mm-hmm. and that I'm personally very excited to see that and I have no doubt that it's happening at, at a it great is, level already it's it's happening the, the the momentum it's it's just getting faster and faster it's incredible the messages I'm receiving from people and you know we're seeing in the growth of the uplifting women in business the the free Facebook group it's fabulous it's exciting <laughs> it is good for you congratulations on that well, you know, I've, I've got a, a great coach in business, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even the times when I pressure you, I'm like, well, then. <laughs> yep. <That's laughs> but it all seems to there. work, so I'm happy. Yeah, it definitely works. Thank you so much. Uh, anything else that you wanted to share today? No, that's it. I would just, um, I think the last and final words is that don't be afraid to fail because it really is not failure. It's just feedback. And I encourage you to get out of your comfort zone because a life spent playing it safe is pretty boring. And there's one thing that I learned from a friend of mine who is older than I am. She's like, the worst thing that you can do is be it kind of like the last day, so to speak, and say, shoulda, coulda, woulda, right? Mm -hmm. I should have done this and I could have done that. And I would have done that. Don't live like that. Really just go all out and have it be fun because this game of life is just a game as Florence Scovel Shen and just make it fun. Mm-hmm. That's it. Make it fun. Love it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today. And thank you very much listeners and viewers and make it a brilliant and joyful day. <laughs>